Hi, everybody. We're going to go ahead and try to tell you some of the successes and why we've had some of the successes with three banded armadillos after over the past 10 or 11 years. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty simple. We're, you know, it's in layman terms because we're not uh, definitely we're not taxonomists or zoologists. Um, but we have figured out some interesting things about the three bandits, which we are excited because um, of uh, the other endangered three banded ar armadillo, Trisinctus. And uh, we think this a lot of this can be used with them because they're so similar. There you go. So first of all, why start uh, an armadillo breeding program? Well, when we started years ago, um, there was like about a hundred armadillos in captivity, something around there. Do we have those? those, those uh, we'll get to it. And and nowadays there's there's more than double that, and they're actually breeding them very well. But back then there wasn't a whole lot going on with breeding. So back in 2011, we saw a need for captive born three banded armadillo ambassadors for education and display. Um, they just proved to be such an easy animal to handle. You could even give them to docents to handle. They um, didn't seem to mind too much. They traveled well, unlike a lot of other small mammals. And they just were becoming very popular, but they were still being imported. They weren't really being bred very well in captivity. There was just a few here and there. So um, as you can see, the AZA stud book at the time was tracking approximately 125 individual armadillos across North American zoological institutions, but they were only reporting two to three offspring per year, which could be because they were mostly used in education and they weren't focusing on breeding, but there was still that need for them. So um, as I said, they're really popular in zoos and we wanted to fulfill that need because we figured that was part of conservation if we could provide a captive source for these animals rather than um, being consumers and taking them from wild populations. Because um, I think everybody will agree that an animal speaks a thousand words or a picture speaks a thousand words. Animals, it's much easier to speak with a live animal and to reach people's um, hearts and minds with a, a live animal. So the importance of good mothers versus genetic diversity in captivity is interesting because what we found was um, some of the mothers weren't so great and some of the mothers were really good. And so we had kind of a disproportionate amount. We had the really good mothers producing a ton of babies and the mothers that weren't so good, we weren't really carrying on their breeding lines. We started with about uh, 30 animals um, that were wild caught that we imported directly from an exporter in um, Paraguay. And um, so when we got those animals, you know, we realized that they were really important bloodlines, but we had to decide what is more important meeting the demand for these three bandits aren't in captivity, so they aren't imported or getting a successful breeding group started. So it's kind of a hybrid. A lot of zoos and institutions are very strict about um, keeping their bloodlines and not breeding this animal to this animal. But we've seen also a trend, especially in hoofstock, um, to manage things more in a, as a herd uh, herd dynamics as a herd population where they bring in maybe they've got something that breeds really well and they can they can get a, a large population of them going and then later on bring in other animals from other countries or other stud books because they're still um, most of these animals that we've bred are going to the United States zoos um, we haven't exported any of them but um, armadillos are popular around a, a lot of the uh, different zoos in the world so it's kind of it's kind of a, a a work in progress, really, to be honest with you. But uh, we still do maintain quite a few bloodlines. But I think what we found is that um, some of these females are superstars, and some of them uh, they probably weren't meant to be breeders in captivity. They didn't take care of their babies and that stuff like that. But as we go on, we find more and more success with the females taking care of their babies and breeding those particular lines. Let me see here. Okay, I think, I think, yeah, we're ready to go. So as I said earlier, I think that um, hopefully, and this is just my opinion, I'm not the expert on this subject, but we can use some of the stuff that we've learned from breeding the um, three, Southern three-banded armadillo, Maticus, for breeding the very endangered Trisinctus. And um, I think uh, maybe Mariella can answer this later, but I don't believe there's but one zoo, one or two zoos in South America that even exhibit Trisinctus. And uh, they really need some help out. And I, I think that this might be a way to show that it, with very fairly low amount of money and um, 
resources that we might be able to pull this off. Okay, so going into the animal care. So the diet, we started out trying all different types of stuff. And remember, we started with imported three banded armadillos that were very compromised. Um, when they came into the market, I would say a lot of the reptile dealers were importing them, and there's probably about a 50% mortality rate. Um, we were able to get that up to about, um, or down, I should say, down to about a 20%, but the animals came in extremely um, emaciated and um, infections and all kinds of different problems, a lot of aggression because they were kept in large quant in groups and in, in uh, unsuitable enclosures. But one of the things we did is we experimented with, first of all, you know, uh, three banded armadillos are, are highly insectiv insectivorous, so we tried all kinds of insects, but we found that they, for some reason, liked the soaked Purina dog kibble, the soaked Missouri insectivore, and fruits, or the different types of fruits. We will get into a, a carrot part of it in just a few minutes. Um, so we, we, we moved from when we first got them in, basically just getting them a high-calorie diet trying to get some weight on them to get them healthy and we used all things like yogurt and hard-boiled eggs and um, high protein baby cereal and um, high protein powders like from health food stores and all different types of stuff to see what we could do and um, we eventually came up with this diet that we have now um, the diet as far as the kibble part everybody always asks us what brand do you use I don't think it matters so much the brand I think what you want to look at is you want to look at the protein levels and um, you know not go for something that's too high in protein that's why the, the dog foods seem to work pretty good and plus we had quite a few animals so we didn't want to go with a really high-end um, dog food because we were using so much of it at the time but but some of the, like the red flannel bites and bones, dry dog food was a good one. We also used, um, what was the other one called? The bite, the little tiny ones. Oh, bites and bones. That's the same That's one. Yeah. So um, yeah, we've used different ones over the years, but uh, basically similar to this diet right here is what we used. Um, the shredded carrots came in later, especially since we were also at the time breeding uh, six banded armadillos and dwarf hairy armadillos and the lesser hairy armadillos, and those guys, those eufractin armadillos are just so quick to become overweight. If any of you have ever had uh, experiences with skunks, skunks are really hard to keep their weight down in captivity. Well, these eufractin armadillos were terrible. So we had to go to the carrots and um, kind of, you know, figured maybe we should do a root crop because the produce that these three bandits probably most likely come into contact in our opinion would be root root vegetables although that you know they they're known to eat a lot of seeds and other things in some of the, the research and some of the paperwork that comes out but it was something that was readily available to us and didn't seem to be problematic and we have been using it for about 10 12 years now without a whole lot of problems the, the thing is though you do want to get the carrots shredded small so their little mouths can handle them but we use the same diet with all four species of armadillos that we've worked with the Missouri diet is a, is a great diet because um, it's pretty much maintained to, to be a, a high quality level. It's always the same, it's always available, and um, it's very useful because it's such a small diet for some of the animals, some of the um, Zenartha that have really small mouths. Like I, I've heard a lot of people are actually using it for um, the lesser uh, anteaters and it works pretty good. But um, we found it to work good. We found that it wasn't too expensive. Um, fairly easy to, to come across um, and it has since then worked very well for us. So as I said, when we first imported them, um, some of the animals, they, it was just incredible to see some of them. We'll talk about body condition later, but apparently in, in speaking to some of the people, they kept them in um, large, almost like pits, probably hundreds of animals in one area. And um, you know, these animals are solitary, so they often came in with lots of uh, lacerations and they were extremely thin, probably some of them up to half their body weight, the ideal body weight that they should be. So originally our, our first thing was just to give them as quickly as we could some um, nutrition and get that body weight up. And so that's where we found out that the yogurt, ripe banana, specifically strawberry yogurt, they seem to like, I'm not sure why. Hard boiled eggs, um, we used S black powder mixed with some of that too to get them a, a, a little bit more protein and um, that seemed to really do the trick so when we have ones in captivity that are convalescing or maybe they're not doing so well 
um, and we, we tend to give them these treats on the side. We didn't have a lot of luck with live insects and we even tried freeze dried mealworms, but we didn't really see a whole lot of interest in it, which was interesting to me. I mean, we could put live crickets in there and, and um, grubs and mealworms and even tried some cockroaches and, and none of them seemed to be really, really interested uh, in those more than they were the diet that we had prepared for them. So with a lot of animals, um, the nursing mothers, we try to give them a little bit of additional uh, protein and nutrition to help them nurse those babies. And it's amazing because, you know, we have no idea how much milk those babies are consuming, but um, they grow incredibly fast. They're like, they're almost the size of the mothers by the time they're ready to wean it around three months. So we figured they've gotta be pulling a lot of calories out of those moms. So just to be on the safe side, we've used um, finely chopped banana and hard boiled eggs as our go-to when we have pregnant females or nursing mothers. We learned quickly that the, the dishes, um, armadillos are little bulldozers and you really can't put a dish in there that they can't turn over. So we tried our best and these were a couple of the dishes that we came up with. Something that, that's heavy like a crock works well. Um, something that's got a, a round, a bigger base than the top works well, but no matter what you do, these little guys, um, we keep them in wood shavings and they get under the bowls, they tip them over, they dig uh, into the bowls, the shavings, and they cover them up and stuff. So, but uh, they seem to pretty much eat their entire diet out of these bowls and they've worked fairly well. It's pretty simple. So as I said earlier, we're, that the three bedded armadillos or the eufractin armadillos get overweight really easy. I mean, especially the six pen, it's just crazy overweight and it's really, really tough to manage sometimes, especially when you have them in a group setting. But we've found that that's not true with the three banded armadillos. I don't think I've ever seen an overweight three banded armadillo. Maybe that's a function of they just don't because they couldn't roll up in a ball and the other ones uh, have a different mechanism for protection. But uh, we have not had that problem luckily because that's, uh, that's saved us a lot of uh, headaches. As I said earlier too, that the bowls are very often uh, buried by shavings and uh, various things. And that's true also of water dishes. So for a long time, we used to go out there every day and we'd fill up, you know, we had 30 dishes that we were tipping over, cleaning out, filling back up. And then you go out there two hours later and they were full of shavings or they were tipped over again. So we experimented with um, water bottles and we use, I think it's about an eight ounce water bottle. It doesn't really matter the brand. But we hang those probably about uh, two to four inches off of the shavings, the level of the shavings. And we still have the problem with them pushing shavings to up against them and it wicking out into the shavings, but not so much as we did with the bowls. And we use, that's one of the reasons why we use an eight ounce water bottle. Because if you use something like a 16 ounce water bottle, you're going to get a lot more water in the bottom of the cage. Uh, these guys come from fairly dry areas. And uh, if we want later on, we can talk to more with Mariella. She's going to be the expert on their natural history. But from what we've read, um, the thorn scrub areas that they live in are fairly dry. And um, so just giving them that one eight ounce water bottle once a day is plenty. If they do push the shavings up against it and they drain it, they're going to be okay. They're going to get it the next day. So we uh, basically, if they if there's less than half the bottle in there, we will fill it back up again. Um, so that's kind of a, a little thing that's interesting, makes it a little easier to care for them. Okay. So housing, let's see. Our housing is very simple and we're actually gonna modify it. Um, at first we tried all different types of shapes of tubs and had problems with some of them. They would climb out of them if they were too short. Um, they wouldn't fit on the racks properly. Um, they had to be a certain height, but you didn't want them so high that you couldn't reach over because remember we were dealing with a group of about 30 animals. And we finally came up with these Rubbermaid plastic tubs that we actually found something even um, a little bit bigger, but these worked really well for, the, for the, um, the initial breeding of them. You can see some of the ones on the rack there, they have um, lids that are cut out and those are what we call our Houdini armadillos, the ones that could climb out. There's probably about three or four of them in there that, that learned how to do that. So we had to put an overhang on them, but it seems to work fairly well. Um, another reason why we use these tubs, is, and I'll talk about this a little later, is that the mothers are so um, particular about their enclosure 
and um, it fits well with how we keep them from worrying or walking around the enclosures with their babies. So of course, being a solitary animal, we house the males separate from the females. Uh, a lot of institutions like to put their animals in with other ones, but um, I think it's been shown with a lot of animals that um, absence of the heart makes it grow fonder, I guess is for the <laughs> lack of a better term, keeping them separate because they are solitary animals and then introducing them back every once in a while. Also, we find that there's less aggression when they're kept separately, except for while they are put together for breeding. So the mothers, when they have their babies, like I said, they're about three months um, before the babies are ready to wean, but it's incredible because the mom is almost, the babies are almost the exact same size as the mom when they're born. Um, we house our breeders all in different housing than we do the rest of our animals. So we don't mix like reptiles in our breeding room. We don't put birds in our res breeding room. It's just three banded armadillos and a few dwarf hairy armadillos. And uh, we're not positive because we haven't tried it the other way, but we think this and talking to other people helps to uh, make the mothers feel safe. They don't have the sense and the smells of something that maybe they might perceive as a predator or a threat to their baby, because that's very often the, the biggest problem with mothers raising their babies is, is not feeling comfortable and that they've got to keep hiding their babies from maybe it's noises or from scents or uh, lights, strong lighting, um, sounds. So we think that's part of our, our uh, success with these animals. So bedding, we tried a lot of different beddings in the beginning. Um, we found that white pine was the easiest to always come across at our feed stores. Um, we used aspen, it wasn't always available. We tried even um, rice hulls. Rice hulls worked okay, but they weren't able to absorb as well as the white pine. But one of the things we did watch out for um, is we found out that the high, the really high dust or not screen shavings were not really good for the animals. It just put too much dust into the air. And as a matter of fact, we have two air purifiers that we use running full time and we still have dust problems. Um, the place is always dusty. It gets, we have to dust out once once a week, even with the purifiers going, but it did make a big difference using the, um, the screen white pine shavings. We do not use any type of cedar shavings because of fumes that come from shavings and, and past problems that other people have with uh, different rodents and animals with them when there's, when, when there's too much of that, the, the, basically the odor from the, from the cedar shavings. So we stuck with white pine and we've had good luck with that. Okay, I think we're ready for the next slide. We've bred most of our other armadillos outside, but because of the initial success that we had with the three banded armadillos and, and not knowing how hardy they could be outside, I, I've never really read of any zoos or institutions keeping them outdoors, even in the summer. So we never really experiment with that. That's something else that we'll have to look into in the future. Um, who knows, maybe they might do okay outside, but all of our armadillos, uh, other than the three bandits are kept outside. The three bandits, we keep them in a barn with a temperature of between 75 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And not to say that they couldn't um, easily stand other temperatures, but we found that a maximum of 90 is, is what we're comfortable with. When they get too hot, you can tell that they get distressed when they get up in like 95 or so. They roll over on their backs. They um, they lay there wide open. You can tell that they're you know overheated a little bit. So we tend to keep them 75 to 80 five degrees for their comfort and, and maybe we're pampering them or spoiling them a little bit, but we found that that works pretty good. We use evaporative coolers because um, we've had good luck with the sloth with evaporative coolers, not drying out the air too much like maybe um, an air conditioner would, but we have used air conditioners as well and they weren't too much of a problem. Um, but th the good thing about the evaporative coolers is, is that they're more efficient, they're more environmentally friendly and they do put some moisture into the air. So because it's such a large colony too, we found it for our own peace of mind, we have backup heating on all of our barns. So what we'll do is we'll use a, a propane heater as the main source of heat. And then we have small electrical heaters, um, just basically just, a, just a, a room heater as a backup in case something like that, that 
the heater went out, the propane heater. The propane heater is easier and it's a lot more efficient than the than electrical heat at this time. Although we are installing a lot of uh, solar powered heating at our new facility, but we found out that electrical heaters weren't really able to keep up with that um, and respond quickly to, to bring the temperatures up. But they were good in maintaining a backup heat in case there was some catastrophic breakdown in the heating system, we could still keep them. Then we're going to go down in like on a 30 degree night and drop down into the 30s. We could still keep them in the 50s to 60s. So we find that to be um, uh, valuable too. Let's see over here. Can we get this over to the side? Here? I can't. Okay. Sure. So um, let's see. I've got a little problem here with my screen. We talked about them lying on their backs when they're having problems with heat stress. Fully open. It's not like just on their back like they normally would but they will lay completely on their backs when they're heat stressed. So that's something you can look out for, easy to see. We just use um, a regular LED shop light for lighting um, cycles. We didn't think that they really needed the UVB. And so far we haven't seen a problem with any vitamin D deficiencies. And um, we kind of like to go on maybe like a drier environment would be more ideal for the armadillos. We haven't seen a lot of fungal infections or anything like that. Um, a foot problems, things that might be caused by damp enclosures, but we've been on the safe side and, and because their habitat tends to be more dry than a lot, some of the other armadillos that are found in forests, we've kept them this way in Southern California. And it's probably pretty easy for us too, because the air that comes in, the fresh air that comes into the environment is naturally dry being in Southern California. Now this not might be something that we need to look into when we're trying to breed a species like Trisinctus that comes from more of a forest environment, but that would be something that we'd have to ask Mariella because I've never seen one in the wild and don't know much about Trisinctus's habitat. Okay, this is probably, you know, this is very, very simple, but I think this is probably the biggest part of our success right here is the housing in the hides. Because we always hear people, and you know, I worked I worked at the San Diego Wild Animal Park for about 28 years in various places, and seven of that was in caring for neonates, and we took care of all different types of stuff. And one of the biggest problems is a lot of the babies we got were from aggression or moms um, worried, not taking care of their babies, not feeling safe, abandoning them. Um, so with the armadillos, we found that a lot of the same was true. If a mother armadillo, and this is especially true of the euphractines, like the three, the six bandits and the dwarf harries and the harries. If a mother armadillo does not feel completely confident and comfortable that her baby is protected, she'll do what we call worrying the baby and run around with it. So this is how we're gonna talk about it in just a few minutes, but this is how we kind of have come to mitigate that. So we always keep enough uh, Bermuda grass in there with the females, even when they're not pregnant, so they can plug the end of their pipe and their pipe or their, their, their nesting areas consists of about a six inch round piece of corrugated black plastic. And then it works well because we find that they can get a grip on the bottom of it and still push around and move themselves. If you use smooth plastic, sometimes they can't flip themselves back over because they have nothing to grab purchase on. I mean, they will lay on their backs in there. So we found that that's just the, your regular old uh, six inch corrugated drain pipe solid without the perforations works best. And then when the females are bred, it's especially important to put that hay in there because if you put enough of this Bermuda hay, you can probably use um, Bermuda. I think orchard grass is another one that's very similar. And there's a few other ones too that they use um, to feed horses. But this fine grass worked really well. It's soft. Um, it stays fluffy. They can get under it. It doesn't tend to absorb too much of the water too much when they push it against their water bottles or, uh, or their food dishes. And this is probably the biggest thing is those tubes where they feel like they've got a burrow and filling up half the enclosure with Bermuda about half full to the top, about half of the length of the enclosure. And then um, we'll show you some pictures here in a moment where we also use um, a solid barrier over the top so the mothers don't see us when we're walking around in there. And I'd say our, our our success rate is probably up to over 95% now with mothers raising their babies between getting good mothers that are good breeders and good and good nursers and uh, using this method to hide them. Uh, I think a lot of times well-meaning keepers and vets want to initially always get um, a weight on that baby right when it's born. But that's when the mom is is making her nest, is bonding with the baby, is feeling comfortable. 
and all that stuff. And I think it's probably the most important time is to leave that baby alone. There, there, it, there, there are the downsides that if there is something that's uh, wrong with the baby that you're not going to know it, you're not going to see it. But I think by looking at the baby, you're going to have more problems with mother abandoning it than you are going to be by things that you don't catch early. So we've just adopted that we don't mess with the babies for um, at least a couple of weeks. We don't pick them up or clean the enclosures. So those hides and that housing is very, very uh, important. We just use simple boltless shelving uh, for the racks that we put them on because we can make it any width or height we want to. And the bins are just cleaned with a sh commercial shop vac. Um, we've down below, I think we'll have some more information about how we clean them. We don't clean them as often as we used to, because we found that they, they are a little bit offended when we mess with their, their bins and their dens and their, and the, and their smells and their stuff. So, um, cleaning is important, but uh, we do do it quite as awesome as we used to. We also find that aggressive animals, again, should be housed alone. Uh, we've even heard of armadillos being put on Prozac because they're aggressive to their cage mates. We don't really go that far, but uh, if an animal's really aggressive in their housing situation, um, we don't use them for breeders, but they can be used for uh, ambassador animals. They work good for that. This is the worrying. Again, this is about the worrying, we call it. And it's not really an official term, but we kind of made it up. So worrying is when the mother paces with the baby in her mouth for extended periods of time. And we've seen this, especially with the six bandits and dwarf Harry's, that they do this. And it, we've also seen it with the three bandits. So this is why it's so important for you to use this, this setup that where they feel safe. Now, there might be other ways to do it. Um, it might look kind of uh, archaic and simple, but it is very simple and it seems to work really, really well. So once the babies are up, up to about two weeks of age, we can start looking at them. We could kind of sex them um, and uh, we can maybe even remove that lid if the mom is not too um, excited about seeing the people walking by and stuff. But we found that it works really, really well and it's very simple. So the gestation on a three band we've found is pretty uh, routine at about 120 days. We do not see any particular signs of ovulation or a season for breeding. Now, some of the literature will say else otherwise, but, but I think ours kind of thinking that they're um, spontaneous ovulators, but that we'll ask uh, Marielle a little bit later and see what she has to say about that. Limiting the noise and movement, as we said earlier, is really important. We don't clean our cages or change them until uh, several weeks after the baby's born and the mom's confident and uh, the baby is a lot more tougher. They grow fast and the shell gets a lot thicker and tougher. So the mom does less damage to the mother if there's an incident. Uh, use about two times the bedding. And uh, as we said earlier, fill half the tub with Bermuda hay during breeding and reproduction. So the babies can be easily hidden. Um, it's hard for a mom to pace with the babies when half of her enclosure is filled with hay. You know, she's just, she goes under it. She, by nature, she's going to crawl under it and she just doesn't have a, a need to pay. So if she's on top of it, it might be a little different. So you can often uh, tell when mothers are getting close to uh, giving birth because they will plug both ends of their tube with that hay, or they will make sort of a nest, a nesting cavity inside of that pile of hay. So, and you have to think of it, you kind of try to put yourself in, which is, you know, hard to do with an armadillo, but put yourself in their their shoes, in their frame of mind. As far as they know, anything outside when they have a baby, any kind of movement is likely to be thought of as a predator in the wild. And um, that's probably true in captivity too. So we, that's again, one of the reasons why we cover the bin and we don't have a whole lot of movement going around. Um, hopefully the mother will not see us as a predator and we just bring her her food and everything goes good with the baby. So as far as we know, there has been nobody that's successfully raised to term a three-banded armadillo um, artificially. But if you do find yourself in that predicament, lots and lots of people have tried and there's a lot of good information out there. But to our knowledge, the best uh, formula, re replacement formula to use for them is S black. And we use it just as it's prescribed on the can, mix it the same. But you do have to come up with a, a kind of an interesting setup for um, giving the babies 
the formula because they don't have that sucking response that like a larger mammal would. So we use these little one cc syringes that you see in the picture. And then we use, it's a pet egg and um, it comes under some different uh, brands sell the exact same nip, but you can get it from pet egg. And we put it up, um, firmly on the end of the syringe and then we can control how much of the formula goes into the baby's mouth very, very precisely. Because again, this is a one cc syringe. It's like an insulin syringe. And we can give them tiny amounts without aspirating them. Because if you try to give them a big nipple and a big bottle, you you know, you know, sometimes they're weak and you squeeze a little bit, you're gonna aspirate the baby, but this has been very successful. This also works for um, quite a few other small babies. And um, if, if you're interested in the future too, we also use something similar to this, but with a butterfly needle with the end cut off of it. So we just use the tube to feed little tiny neonate primates, but this syringe thing works really, really well, this little contraption that we've come up with, and I'm sure other people are using it. Uh, there's something called a miracle nipple that is similar, but we found that this shaped nipple works better. We have successfully hand-raised six-banded and dwarf hairies and lesser hairy armadillos. But again, as I said, that we have not been able to do the three-banded. If people are interested though in the literature and some of the documentation, James and Kirsten Badman have done an excellent job. Um, they are of the Red Mountain Conservation and Education Center. And he also works for the University of Arizona, Arizona in Phoenix. And he has detailed records in this uh, basically kept in touch with a lot of other people in other countries and zoos that have done this. So he would have some good uh, data on how to raise baby three banded armadillos or what they've worked with. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to maybe eventually be able to raise them sometimes because there there is the need to hand raise baby three banded armadillos for every once in a while. His uh, email right there is right there at the bottom of the screen. And he has given me permission to give that out. So you guys are free to email him if you have any questions on hand raising three banded armadillos. So this is kind of through trial and error over 10 years, what we came up works best. We introduced the male for 90 days, because like I said, we can't really determine the ovulation of the females or when they're ready to breed. So we figured, you know, why don't we put them in? We'll put them in for 90 days, short of the 120 day gestation period, because the males will attack the babies sometimes. Um, you have to be very careful with the males because some males are not good breeders because they're too aggressive with the females. One of the easiest way to tell that, besides, you know, you really wanna watch them for a few hours uh, when you don't have a proven male, but you can look at the, the, the soft bands in between the hard bands on the shell and they will scratch them and make them bloody. And that you can tell that's they're, they're really attacking them and really scratching at them. They'll even lay on their sides and they'll fight on their sides. Um, but very often it's, if you're gonna have some aggression, it's gonna be the male that's being more aggressive, maybe because the female won't submit and breed, maybe just because he's an honorary male, but you do have the problem with females also attacking males. So we suggest that uh, with new animals that aren't proven yet, you, uh, you do keep a close eye on them for the first few days. Any males that, as I said earlier, that are too aggressive, we tend to just, we use them as education animals. Uh, they make great fine and education animals, but some of them are just too too aggressive to be used as breeders and they're retired from the breeding uh, program. Females are not always great mothers, just like it, you know, at, at the wild animal park and some of the other animals we've bred. We've had females that just wouldn't raise their babies. And that's true of the three banded armadillos as well. And we also retire them from our breeding programs and use them as ambassadors. We generally give them about three tries, and if they don't successfully raise a baby then they are used in an educational pro program as an ambassador. It's not unusual for a first-time mom to fail with the first baby. You know, uh, when I worked with elephants, we had a lot of the first babies born um, to elephants were not successful at the time. I don't know if it's still the tr true, but it might have something to do with getting the birthing canal stretched and ready for the, the next baby. It might have something to do with the stress of giving birth. But we often find that if there is a first time mother that has not raised her baby, don't be too alarmed and give her a couple more tries. And then uh, another thing we found is, is probably important is to give the mom a little bit of a break um, to recover from the baby that she's had. So we give them about two months to rest up before we breed them again. The babies, because of our, uh, basically that we don't really watch them closely uh, one of our next steps is we'd like to maybe put in some cameras and so we can observe it a little bit more, but we don't really 
know exactly the time that the baby is nursed for from the mother. So we always give them at least two months. Um, and then we will start giving them the solids. The babies it, it vary in about the amount of time at which they'll start taking those solids. But two months of age seems to be about a good average. And they will continue to nurse from their mother while they're also exploring, nibbling on the solids. A, a good thing about that too is not, you know, you're not taking the baby all the way, sudden away from the mother who's nursing. It's watching the mother and it's watching them what the mother eats and uh, kind of mimicking her. So we found that that helps too. The mom's kind of helping us to wean the babies by teaching them, but also they still have the benefit of the uh, mother's milk. And then we don't ever really wean them until three months of age. They might be able to wean earlier than this, but uh, we've found that it's, you know, better safe than sorry. And we don't push that. And we've had really good luck with that three month period. Sometimes even longer, just keep an eye on the mothers that they're not getting too, um, anxious to get away from their babies like some mothers do. In the beginning, because we started with wild-caught animals, um, we had a worming policy of every six months. And we would alternate wormers because we didn't want to create um, parasites that were resistant to one wormer over the other. And I did, you've heard about humongous and some of the herds of hoofstock in different zoos, and they're just, they're basically resistant to parental pomade and to fenbendazole. And that's basically our front line right there, those two drugs. So we we use both. And I suggest that you talk to your vet. Um, we have do have a dosage that we use, but um, it's not really considered ethical to give out vet prescriptions or advice or dosages. And I'm not a vet, so, but we do have very good success with Safeguard, um, fenbendazole and parental pomade, or it's also called, um, uh, I'll remember this in a minute. There's another name that goes by, but the, but the generic name is Pyrantel Pomate, and it's very, very safe to use. It's got a huge margin for overdose, and we've never had a problem with it. Now, uh, currently, we aren't doing any wor worming because we've been doing it for like five or six years, and we found that we haven't introduced any new animals. We don't keep them outside in the dirt, so we don't have that reintroduction of parasites. But if you're not sure, that it's, it's a good thing to look for. And you can also do... Um, uh, you could do fecals and have them checked too. The nails very often don't have a big problem with them. You think we would because they're in plastic bins, they're in shavings, they don't have that digging opportunity, but we don't have a whole lot of problem with them. But we also have found that the ones that do, it's very easy to trim their nails with a dog nail trimmer, the one that has a little guard on the end of it. Um, if you're very slow and you get them used to it and you just do, you might only be able to do one or two nails at a time, but you can trim the nails. You just want to stay um, at the very tips and just do a little bit at a time. We've never really had, we've never quicked one too bad um, and haven't had a problem with that, but I would suggest you have some uh, quick stuff with you too, just in case. Um, we also have to trim our sloth nails too. And we do that a little differently because they're much larger. With minor abrasions and cuts, say like when there's a breeding incidence where the male scratches up the female's back, that doesn't mean you absolutely separate them because that's kind of normal. There's a little bit of rough play sometimes, but we just tend to use a chlorhexidine solution or a chlorhexidine cream, anything you want like that. It seems to be pretty uh, safe and efficient on their skin. We used to use betadine, but um, there's a lot of talk about um, some of the, the uh, betadine causing a little bit of a burn or a little bit of an irritation on skin. And we found that the Clorox time works great, no problem. Eye infections, once we got the wild caught ones established, we didn't have a whole lot of problems with eye infections, but every once in a while, if we saw maybe a crusty eye or a weepy eye, we would use a teramycin ophthalmic ointment. And then in some of our six banded armadillos, we found that when that didn't work, we had to go to a steroidal ointment. But that's something, again, I would uh, recommend talking to your vet about because they're two completely different medicines for two completely different infections or problems. Skin infections have not seemed to be too much of a problem. Um, on the surface, every once in a while, like I said, scratches, just superficial things, not a problem. But we have had a few problems where we've had like, it's almost like a deep abscess. And it's very hard to diagnose because of that that hard shell. The shell, I, I can't tell you a lot about the um, morphology of their shell, but it seems to almost overlap underneath with the soft tissue on the top. 
And so a lot of times the abscess can get quite large before it erupts through those bony plates. Um, so you don't really see a lump like you would on a soft skinned animal that doesn't have that external hard shell. So that's something to look out for. A lot of times it reminds me of when I used to take care of elephant feet, it will blow out underneath the shell where it has soft tissue rather than come up through the top. But again, we haven't had that too much of a problem. I think that's one of the reasons we tend to keep them a little drier is because we worry more about um, bacterial abscesses in a wet environment. And, um, and if you're if you're concerned about it, we can also, we've taken, we've used a spray, not sure about it. We've used an old sand spray, spray it directly on and leave it on. It doesn't hurt them. It's not toxic to them at that level we found. Uh, again, feel free at any time we use IDEX laboratories to use fecal cultures and fecal exams. But uh, to the right is a very exciting picture of a pelleted stool. <laughs> and it's pretty much, I mean, if your armadillo has loose runny stools, there's something wrong with it because this is generally what we get. We get hard pelleted stools that dry up very quickly. If it has diarrhea, it's most likely got some type of uh, um, uh, an intestinal infection or maybe um, something that's not quite feeling well, and I, I would send a fecal culture and then fecal examine when you see loose stools. So thoughts on veterinary procedures. Throughout the years of breeding the, them, we've shipped a lot of different animals to a lot of different zoos and, and institutions. We've always found that the vets are very anxious to get fecals and to, to basically to, to guarantee themselves as well as they can that they're not bringing any type of pathogens into the collection, which is understandable. But um, you have to be careful that we don't get too overzealous of, of a vet that wants to, to knock these armadillos out. Um, one instance where the, a zoo wanted an animal to be have a blood test done at an institution before it was shipped, they were able to, to anesthetize the animals and get it under, which is, is pretty uh, difficult in itself. But when they did, they couldn't get a blood, blood draw from it. So I'm not sure that there's any real value in taking blood draws from these animals. Um, simply for the purpose of shipping them when they appear heavy, when they appear uh, of appropriate weight and healthy. Again, we don't think it's really worth anesthetizing our armadillos for yearly exams because I think it's it's has a possible a more to do more harm than good. They're generally pretty harm, hardy animals, and if you did anesthetize them, I don't know if they have the values for their heart rates and all this other stuff. It's it's pretty easy to tell a healthy um, armadillo. One of the ways we do that is we use a clear shoe box, like an acrylic shoe box, um, hard plastic that you get at the uh, drugstore. And if you put your animal under there, with no shavings, and you leave it alone for a few minutes, you can usually slowly pick up the box and observe the entire underside of the armadillo. Now I've tried, um, this is, I don't recommend sticking your finger in uh, alongside the shell and their legs, to keep them from closing up because it doesn't it doesn't work too well. <laughs> they close on your finger and every time you move, they tighten down tighter. So you have to sit there perfectly still, like having your finger stuck in a car door while they're uh, they uh, they let loose on it. But this works really well. We've had really good luck with using the, the plastic shoe box. Um, the body condition we do weigh our armadillos, and um, each one varies a little bit. So there's not like an ideal body weight. But if you want, we, if people want to, we can also come up with some more body weights. But you can really tell a sick or an armadillo that doesn't have good body condition because there's almost room, there's like room for one or two fingers between the sides of their legs and their body and the inside of the shell. It's really prominent. You can tell a thin three bed armadillo pretty easily. They really, they really show that off when they're not doing well. And also we tend to not breed armadillos with severe shell deformations. Um, the picture on the left right here isn't life threatening to the animal. And um, the animal did fine, live, you know, still alive, lived for years. We used it as an education animal, but we figured maybe that wasn't something that we did, we'd want to, to breed forward into the population. Uh, didn't see a whole lot of that in the wild population of the animals that came in. So we figured maybe it was a good idea not to, to, to pass that forward. But you will see um, some variations in shell bands and such too, and it's nothing really to be too alarmed about. Um, this one was probably, a, the one that we could find was very minor. And other ones we've had where they almost had sort of a, um, a, a valley or a divot in their shell. Um, it looked like kind of like a peach. Um, we especially didn't breed those ones. 
there's also something that's interesting and um, we don't know what the function of it is. Um, there might be some people out there that do and we'd be interested in knowing too. It's not unusual to have kind of a, a, a orange exudate around the base of the tail, kind of a waxy substance. And I'm sure it serves some purpose, but we have not figured that out yet. So our average weights are between one and 1 1.4 kilograms. Uh, we can get a little more specific than that, but I think that's a pretty good uh, basis. Full growth in the shell and the size of the animal is between six and nine months. When the babies, I said, at three months, they're almost the same size as their mom, which is kind of amazing to me. They live for 20, 20 plus years, and I've heard of reproductive females in the 20s. So it's interesting to me, I guess it, maybe it's a form of um, protection. If they can get as big and their shell develop as quickly as they can in a short time, they're going to be less vulnerable to predators. But it's 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 very impressive to see the, the quick growth in these animals. As we talked about uh, observing the body condition, use that uh, clear box, shoe box, looks great. Uh, interesting thing that we found out with the three abandoned armadillos is that they've got a right tail versus a left tail. It may not mean anything, but it is interesting that they do. They either go to one side or the other, and that is continuous. It doesn't change throughout life. Uh, we've seen videos and cute little uh, instances where the people have a video you have a three bended plane with a toy. If you look closely, it's trying to kill the toy, usually, in our opinion. Um, you know, some of the, the three bendeds are probably a little more timid, maybe not quite as intelligent as some of like the eufractine armadillos, like the six banded armadillos. In my opinion, uh, giving them toys is more something they're going to show aggression towards. You can do it. I don't know if it has any benefits to it, but you can give them. Uh, other types of enrichment um, opportunities. There's, there's things that you can do besides toys. The th another interesting thing that um, may not have any uh, effects on the animal, but we see birthmarks. Just about every little armadillo that's born is born with a little, little dark colored birthmark on it. You can see that in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, it's sometimes on the top of the shell, sometimes at the bottom, it's sometimes on the edge, but most of them do have a bit birthmark. Longevity, 20 years plus in captivity, that includes females that have reproduced up to 20 years old, um, not at our facility, but at other facilities, there's been reports. And um, that's interesting too, because you know that's for a mammal, that's pretty old. And then shipping and transport. Shipping and transport's been pretty sh simple for us. When they're originally um, imported into the United States, they generally come in wooden crates with wire on them. We found that the wooden crates with wire on them is not a great idea because they tend to rub their noses until they're raw on the wire. And sometimes the wood will splinter as they try to, to burrow out of it. We found a better alternative is to use a small airline approved uh, crate, probably one of the smaller ones that they, it's the very smallest one they have for like small cats and puppies. And um, make sure that you have lots and lots of shredded newspaper. We use the shredded newspaper because there's not an issue uh, with that shipping across state lines or sometimes other agricultural facilities may not want uh, unknown grasses coming across into their their jurisdiction. So we use shredded newspaper. We find that they can hide in it. We fill the entire thing up until it's to the top of the cage and we just put a layer of several sheets of just uh, flat newspaper underneath to absorb any urine or feces. And we've had really good luck with that. Never lost an animal in shipping or transport. The other thing that works really good too is um, put a water bottle on the side. We found that you don't necessarily have to fill it if it's a short shipping, like, you know, say it's within 12 hours, you don't have to put it there, but it, it can make the attendants at the airport feel a lot more comfortable that they've got an easy method of giving your animal water if it needs to. If you put it on, uh, in before you ship and it rides into the airport in your car, it will vibrate and naturally just it'll empty the water bottle. So if you if you do have to put water in there, we suggest you put about a half a bottle and put it after that's arrived at the airport and it's not going to be bouncing around. This just shows. So here are some of the happy faces. Um, this is one of our most popular animals. Um, we use all different types of animals um, with our, our Make-A-Wish children. And um, we really, really like the three bandits because it's it's easy for us. There's not a lot of stress. The animals aren't going to hurt a child. The animals never have never bitten children, um, and they've got 
basically that you can worry you the only thing to really worry about is them scratching them and, the, and those scratches are superficial of course you always want to have really good um animal handlers and be careful and make sure the kids are sitting down so they don't drop the armadillos from a height and um, don't stick their finger of course inside the shells with the armadillos because that's always uncomfortable uh, which i found out the hard way many times so i think we're gonna now probably take some questions thank you kevin for that Thank you, Wendy, for assisting. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar live. And uh, my name is Kenny Coogan. I'm the Education Coordinator for the IUCN SSC Anteater Sloth and Armadillo Specialist Group. Kevin mentioned Mariella several times. She's the chairperson of the specialist group, and she will be joining us in just a moment. We have a website. It is Zanarthrins. Dot org, which are those three wonderful groups of animals that I just mentioned. They're called Xenarthrins. We have an Instagram page. We are on Facebook and we have a YouTube channel. We've had the YouTube channel for a little over a year now where we post all of our webinars and we also post some educational materials, which we're going to talk about in a second. If you go to Xenarthrins.org, our website is available in Brazilian, Portuguese, Spanish, and English. And if you go to the top part where it says species, you will see that we have species uh, profile information for the three uh, taxa. We have descriptions and habitat and ecology. And this is really for adults. So I know a lot of zookeepers are on right now. We encourage you to utilize it. Now on the YouTube page and on our website, and on our social media, we have a couple of animated videos that talk about each of the uh, genera, not genera, the families that we have. And then we also have a animated video about past, present, and futures in our things, which I really like because then you get to see the giant glyptodons and giant ground sauce and things like that. On our website, we have Lots of activities. We have coloring sheets, we have mazes, we have spot the differences, and uh, all of these are available in Spanish, English, and Portuguese. They're all printable. And uh, I just want to remind everyone to save the dates. This Saturday, this very Saturday, is International Sloth Day. And then in November, we have World Anteater Day. A lot of people have been competing confused about International Sloth Day. It is the third Saturday of October, and therefore the date changes. So this year, it is October 21st. All right. We usually do conservation cult and uh, husbandry webinars, but guess what? I like extinct Xenarthrins. So next week, we will have a ground sloth, tree sloth, and ancient sea sloth webinar, just for fun. If you are a zookeeper or if you are a scientist out there in the wilds of North, Central, or South America, and you have photos, you can send them to me, and I would love to post them on our Facebook and Instagram page. And they don't even have to, they can be real animals, that's, that's the preferred one, but if you can draw, if you are making a cake that looks like an armadillo or a sloth to celebrate these wonderful animals, we'll share that too. If you feel inspired by the specialist group's conservation and education efforts, we have a donation uh, link and you can outright just uh, give us money. But what's more fun is we have a store and in the store, we have dozens and dozens of options. We have glyptodons, we have giant uh, ground sloths, we have anteaters, we have anteater families, we have tamanduas, because somebody requested a tamandua t-shirt and we made it possible for them. So look at all these wonderful people celebrating and more importantly, uh, helping fund our conservation or education efforts. And this uh, company ships worldwide. And I say this for every webinar, we want to thank our partner institutions for helping fund our education initiatives, which include the webinars. And those partner institutions are FIA, Foundation for International Aid to Animals, and Nurtured by Nature. This is the first time that we've had Wendy and Kevin 
who are part of Nurture by Nature do a webinar. So it is uh, perfect. Um, so first of all, thank you so much. That was really great and very interesting uh, webinar. I loved it. And Lauren is officially requesting a three-banded armadillo merchandise. So Kenny, we'll yeah. need a t-shirt and socks and mugs with three-banded yep. armadillos on it. Uh, James says, a highly experienced breeder told us that they get plenty of water from their food sources like fruit, veggies, and soaked Missouri and do not need a water. What are your thoughts on that? And I'll, maybe I'll just add, um, is the Missouri or the insectivore diet, is that pre-soaked? So the, the diet is soaked. It's pre-soaked. Um, both kibbles are the Missouri insectivore and the dog kibble. And it, it, my experience, uh, there's very few animals that don't need some kind of, um, whether it's the dew off of plants, even in the desert, uh, or uh, some some type of water, like straight water, not something just out of their food. It's true, things like uh, Russian tortoises, Euromastics lizards, and there are some desert species that can go their entire lives without water. But um, I've never seen any harms from too much water. And they use it all the time. I mean, we're talking these animals are drinking at least half a bottle um, in two days. So that is quite a bit of water. And I think it would be detrimental to not give them water, in my opinion. They indeed live in very dry, arid habitats. And uh, I mainly work with Adiospeci and, and I breed them. And I do a lot of rehab work with them. And they usually, they don't know uh, how to drink water. And I received a couple of three-banded armadillos too. And they just didn't know. They were dehydrated, but they didn't know what to do with a plate with water on it. Mm -hmm. So apparently they really they don't drink any water. However, if you feel them, uh, dog kibble, cat kibble, whatever, they really, they need to drink water. So in the, <laughs> sorry, that's all my dogs <laughs> getting <laughs> crazy. So um, in my case, um, I have to teach them to drink water. Uh, otherwise, uh, they, they don't know what to do. That's where the water bottles come in kind of handy, too, because it's like a dew drop on the end of it. So as, as they're yeah. going around, their, their nose hits it, and they lick the end of their nose. Right. That That's certainly easier. And it's also, I mean, um, it's difficult to put a water bowl into a, an enclosure, an armadillo enclosure, because of all the topics that you mentioned that they dig under it, they dig over it, and uh, etc. Yeah. Uh, now, um, I think it is important to leave them water or a water bottle in case they they need the water. What I see is that if I feed my armadillos dog or cat kibble, they will drink water. If I give them anything else, they will not even touch it. So it's really, it depends on, on the food uh, you're going to, to feed your armadillos. Interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Catherine says, have you observed rocks or slates being enough to trim your armadillos nails? Like when they're just walking over it to maintain uh, their little pads and their nails? I, I would think that um, in a large enclosure, like an exhibit a piece of slate would be fine um even even some hard dirt just you got to be careful of you know of, of um obstructions or, um if they ate the dirt we just play it safe with ours because we have so many we can't really observe their stool and everything all the time but if you had a you know if you have a single or a pair i think slate or some hard dirt is fine um it's a little harder to clean it's not as you know as as clean as as using something like disposable like shavings, but I've seen I've seen them in those instances in captivity. And like I said, you'd have to ask Mariella on anything in the wild because I have really no experience with armadillos in the wild. This is we're just speaking our own experiences in captivity. Um, but one thing I would caution is against things like really rough cement or sandpapery type materials because they do have um, somewhat um, thin soles on the on their feet and they do they do kind of walk on their nails don't you think Wendy the front ones they walk on the nails the front the ones back, they yeah walk on their pads yeah so I I would be I would definitely be very careful about something that um, is overly rough because when we have Asian small claw otters and anything rough is terrible on their little pads because they don't they don't walk on their nails they walk just on their fingers and their their soles of their feet so 
but um, Mary Ellis probably seen them in different situations in the kind of soil that they would dig in. So she might be able to tell you more about that. Well, in our area, there were three banded armadillos. Uh, they are extinct <laughs> in wow. Mendoza province, but it's uh, all sand. So uh, it is quite abrasive and they walk on the tip of their claw. So I would expect that uh, they get worn, worn down uh, with time. Also, they do dig. Uh, there's a question about uh, moving their hides right now in the chat. Uh, they do dig. So if they dig in the sand, I'm sure that they would also wear down their, their claws. Torianis asks, what is the oldest age for male and females to successfully reproduce? Well, we've been breeding them for about 12 years. So our experience is just about 12 years. But um, there's been reports. I think Dennis Merritt um, is one of the pioneers in captive three banded armadillo breeding and a lot of different Zenarthrins. And um, there, so there might be some information um, from some of his projects. But I, I do recall um, that they have been bred up to into the 20 years of age, which is interesting to me. What do you uh, think, Mary Ellen? Yeah, I don't remember the, the details of, of Dennis Merritt's uh, studies. We should invite him and insist that he also holds a, a webinar. I mean, he has so much experience. We'll there was a, there was like an appendix that listed all the different papers on armadillos that I, I researched about 12 years ago. And there was a particular one about uh, dwarf harries and how similar their habitat was to the Sonoran Desert. Do you, do you recall that, oh, yeah. that resource? Uh, no, no. But we can track it down. <laughs> yeah. All right, Kevin, kind of related. Shannon, who I've known for probably a decade or more, asks, is there a lot of variance in the 120-day uh, gestation period? I, you know, I don't think there is. It's pretty, it's pretty spot on usually. Um, I have to say that one of our keepers who's probably watching, um, her name is Sarah Stuck, and she is the reason we have had over 150 baby armadillos born successfully. Successfully, those are ones that have made it to adulthood. Um, so uh, she, we have to give a lot of our credit to her. And if we we could ask, that's something we could ask her. She is the premier um, Yenta of Hi armadillos. There. <laughs> I hear her. So. Uh, I have seen that being pretty spot on most of the time, but we have had some um, slight variation um, in having maybe about a week before the 120 day um, gestation period, um, but pretty, pretty spot on on that 120 day typically. Yeah, that's quite a bit a week. So that's interesting. Yeah, how, yeah. How, there, how, there have been some, how, some super quickie surprises <laughs> is that a lot or is it more no a... there was one that just happened and i was i was yeah. because it had been so consistent before i was like huh but it, it you know i knew when they had started breeding i knew when that baby was born and i was like okay cool that that happened um so yeah there was one case where there was dramatic like that a week and then the rest of them are pretty spot on Kate and several other people would like to know, can you go more in depth on what enrichment is effective for this species? Okay, that's an interesting subject because enrichment is great stuff. But one of the thing, first things I always say is enrichment also kills because I've seen many, many animals um, perish through well-meaning enrichment. So with them, I'd just be very careful about anything they can get their head stuck in. And if it's big enough, their head to go in, they can get it stuck in. Um, I would be careful of any kind of um, strange or new um, materials that they might ingest or chew up and eat. Like, you know, like I've never used coconut husk with them or, or coconut bedding. I'm not sure if that would be wise, but you can take hard plastic items because they can't really break them. Um, and like, for instance, you ever seen the cat, little cat feeder balls that have a hole in them and they come in half. You can take those in if you need to, because the arm dills may not be as, as, uh, manipulative as a, as a cat you can sand down the edges so they come apart easier and you can put all kinds of enrichment including live insects in there um in an exhibit i used um 
it's called hypertufa, but it's basically just artificial cement and made cricket uh, feeders that look like um, uh, termite mounds. So you put them in a chamber and they curl at the top. You can do that. As I said, ours don't really go crazy over crickets and stuff like that, but it, that, it tends to work somewhat with mealworms. Um, and other than that, I, you know, I'm trying to, I stay away from, I stay away from things like, um, any kind of cordage or rope, um, because if they ingest it or if it gets wrapped around their neck, I mean, I've seen so many instances of animals that have had a chain in their cage or, or something like that. And they ended up it becoming a big problem because they got it wrapped around their necks. So I'm, I'm very shy about putting anything with a cord or rope. Um, I think smells is something that would be very interesting to them. Um, we have not done that with ours, as far as I know, unless Sarah, have you used any smells with the armadillos? But I think, I think uh, most of the Only uh, in the program situations when we've just had novel smells from other animals and we see a little bit of interest in terms of um, like other animal smells. So obviously if you know that your animals are healthy and safe, you could always just kind of, you know, rub a little bit of their scent in their bedding and, uh, you know, they can smell that. Hey, who asked the question. She says that we have done smells in paper bags with success. And Catherine adds, our armadillos are armadillo. The door scents, we put them on balls and she pushes them around and sniffs everything. Oftentimes it's herbs and kitchen scents. Uh, Tiago says, great job with the presentation. Do you separate the males from the females just before the birth or for the first three months? We always keep the males separate from the females, except for when they're breeding, because as far as we know, they're, you know, they are solitary animals in the wild, so we, we try to give them that. But um, the males are left in for a total of 90 days. So we are just, what is that, like 30 days short mm -hmm. of the normal gestation period to be safe. Um, you know, sometimes females that are solitary will get upset or a little worried when the male's still around and it's getting close to time to give birth. It's like, why is this dude here? He's not supposed to be here. Um, so I think that 30 days gives you that safe margin. Um, we don't keep our animals together, but a lot of zoos do. Um, but the problem is if we have animals together and then we want to use one as an outreach animal, um, we don't know if it's pregnant. We don't know when it bred. Um, so we could run into that problem. We don't use, generally we use uh, animals that aren't in our breeding program for outreach or in, uh, to with the public. Kevin, you mentioned at some moment, or you asked if there was a breeding program for Brazilian three-banded armadillos. I just checked yeah, with that. Flavia Miranda, who knows about that stuff. Uh, and she said that Brasilia Zoo uh, actually has a breeding program, but their male just died. So, mm -hmm. and it's very difficult to get hold of um, Brazilian three-banded armadillos. Now, interestingly, she mentioned that there are rumors that there are about six individuals in European zoos, but we do not have any confirmation. And I checked a couple of websites right now, and I think they just don't know what they have, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, because uh, it really, it looks like uh, they have uh, Southern three-banded armadillos, but then the information they give on their uh, zoo website is about the Brazilian. Three that, that so, brings up a quick question. Yeah. Some of the imports that were coming in years ago, they were coming in melanistic or almost all dark brown or to, to, to even darker than that. Is that something you've seen with the, um, the Maticus, the Southern three-banded? Uh, yes. Yes, I actually, I have uh, had some in rehab that were almost black. Yeah. Uh, really, really dark. And some others were kind of sandy. So... Uh, I honestly, I don't know um, what it is related to. I even see that in inside your speech. Some are almost black and others are very tan. So um, there seems to be individual variation. I don't know if it has something to do with the diet, maybe. Hmm. But I don't think that there is any study about that. Yeah. Not yet. All right. Well, thank you everyone for attending this live. Tell your colleagues it will be posted in a day or two. Next week, giant ground sloths. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
celebration of International Sloth Day. Let me let me just read out uh, Krista's comment. She said that one of her girls loves to shred papers and boxes. Phone books with mealworms inside are loads of fun. Mm. If you still get a phone book. I was just going to say go that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That was great. 